The first step of the infinium assay is amplification. Remove the amplification reagent from the freezer, allow to thaw, and pour into a disposable trough. Set the hybridization oven to 37 degrees Celsius. The infinium assay begins with a whole genome amplification. This starts with a purified genomic DNA sample. The DNA is denatured, then amplified in an isothermal reaction. Using whole genome amplification is ideal because it eliminates the GC bias of PCR. This step of the infinium assay uniformly amplifies DNA by 1,000 fold. The next step in the infinium assay is fragmentation. Remove the fragmentation reagent from the freezer, allow to thaw, and pour into a disposable trough. Set the heat block to 37 degrees Celsius. This step fragments the DNA sample. The purpose of this step is to cleave DNA into fragments of the optimal length for hybridization to an alumina bead chip. This controlled enzymatic process cleaves DNA into segments of 300 to 600 base pairs. The process uses endpoint fragmentation, which is not as time sensitive as other methods, to avoid over fragmenting the DNA sample. The next step in the infinium assay is precipitation. Remove the precipitation reagent from 4 degrees Celsius and allow to equilibrate to room temperature. Also at this time, remove the resuspension reagent from the freezer as to allow it at least one hour to thaw. Set the heat block to 37 degrees Celsius. Set the centrifuge at 4 degrees Celsius. Before hybridizing the DNA sample to an array, the sample is purified by isopropanol precipitation. First, the blue precipitation reagent is added to each sample. Then, the DNA is collected by centrifugation, and the supernatant is removed. In this step, we will look at the technique for decanting the supernatant from the pellet following the precipitation step. It is important to remove the amplification plate from the centrifuge immediately following the 20-minute spin described in the EUCs. Delays can cause the pellet to loosen and may lead to loss of sample. If a delay occurs, re-spin the plate prior to proceeding. This is a typical amplification plate following the precipitation step. The DNA pellets should be blue and clearly visible at the bottom of each well. The bench top should have an absorbent pad ready for the decanting procedure. To decant the supernatant, first remove the cap mat from the plate. Then, quickly and firmly invert the plate onto the absorbent bench pad in a straight up and down motion. Lift the plate straight up, allowing the supernatant to drain without entering other wells. Firmly tap the plate around the dry areas of the absorbent pad for one minute. Place the plate face down atop a tube rack. Leave to dry for one hour. Be sure to avoid a large looping motion, as this can potentially loosen the pellet. Also, avoid slowly inverting the plate, as this can lead to cross-contamination. The next step in the infinium assay is resuspension. It is important to dispense fresh resuspension reagent each time for the resuspension step. Pour the resuspension reagent into a disposable trough. Set the hybridization oven to 48 degrees Celsius. After the pellet has been allowed to dry, it is resuspended in hybridization buffer. This buffer provides ideal conditions for the next step, hybridization to the bead chip. The next step in the infinium assay is hybridization. If not already set from the resuspend step, set the hybridization oven to 48 degrees Celsius. 
and preheat the heat block to 95 degrees Celsius. Following the incubation at 95 degrees Celsius, allow the amplification plate to sit at room temperature for 30 minutes. Pulse spin the plate prior to proceeding with hybridization. In the hybridization step, the sample is removed from the microtiter plate and applied to the bead chip. An alumina bead chip contains millions of tiny spherical beads embedded in the array's surface. Each bead is coated with DNA oligonucleotide probes. This is a cutaway view of the three beads on an alumina bead chip. Each of the three beads in this example will perform a different SNP assay, so each of the beads has a different probe sequence on its surface. On each bead are hundreds of thousands of copies of the oligo probe. To simplify this description, only two probe molecules are shown on each bead. During the hybridization step, the DNA sample is applied to a bead chip where it anneals to the locus-specific probes. The probes are complementary to the bases adjacent to, but not including, the SNP base. The specificity of this hybridization is ensured by the length of the probes, the high stringency buffer conditions, and elevated temperatures. To manually load a bead chip, pipette the sample from one well of the amplification plate onto the opening in the seal. Be sure to record the barcode number and bead chip section for each sample applied to a bead chip. Be sure that the sample wicks across the section completely. Wicking may occur slower than shown here. Once all samples have been loaded, place the bead chips into the alumina hybridization chamber. The hybridization chamber should be at room temperature. Hybridization takes place overnight at 48 degrees Celsius. Following the hybridization procedure, resuspend the wash and coating reagent for use the following day. Store remaining resuspension reagent at minus 20 degrees Celsius. It will be used in subsequent protocol steps. The technique for removing the bead chip cover seal will be detailed. Following overnight hybridization, remove the hybridization chamber from the 48 degrees Celsius oven and allow the closed chamber to cool down for 25 minutes prior to bead chip removal. Remove the bead chips from the hybridization chamber for seal removal. To remove the seal, hold the bead chip face up and angled slightly downward. Slowly creep the seal diagonally across the surface of the bead chip until the first corner of the sample area on the bead chip is exposed. The seal should be pulled away from you, diagonally, in a continuous upward motion. Immediately place the peeled bead chip in wash buffer. Do not pause between seal removal and placing the bead chip in the wash buffer. The technique for assembling the flow through chambers for each bead chip will be detailed. This process occurs just prior to the extend and stain, or X-stain, protocol step. To assemble flow cells for four bead chips, you will need an alignment fixture, absorbent bench pad, scissors, four black metal frames, four glass back plates, being sure to confirm you are using the correct glass back plates for your assay, four plastic spacers, eight metal clamps, a compressed air duster, graduated cylinder, and alumina wash buffer. First, place the black frame in the grooves and fill the alignment fixture with the directed volume of buffer as described in the EUCs. Next, place the bead chip on top of the frame, aligning the barcode of the bead chip with the barcode symbol engraved on the fixture. Once the bead chips are completely submerged in buffer, it is safe to remove any residual glue remaining on the bead chip. Remove the white or opaque backing of the clear plastic spacer and place the clear spacer onto the bead chip. Place the black alignment bar on the alignment fixture to provide a guide for the glass back plate. Clean the glass back plates with wipes soaked in 70% ethanol and allow to dry prior to using in the flow through chamber. After every use, submerge the plastic rack with the glass back plates in a container of 1% alkanox solution. Wipe all glass with a Kim wipe and return to the rack. 
Thoroughly rinse all glass with DI water and allow to dry. Finally, use compressed air to remove any dust or lint. Place the clean, dust-free glass plates onto the bead chips so that the inclined edge is face down over the barcode, creating a well. Snap the two metal clamps onto the flow cell. Remove the black alignment bar and pick up the now assembled flow through chamber. Finally, use the scissors to snip off the excess plastic from the spacer. The flow through chamber is now ready for the X stain protocol. The next step in the infinium assay is X stain. Thaw all X stain reagents. Set the water circulator attached to the T flow block to 44 degrees Celsius. If performing X stain on the T can robot, the water circulator will automatically turn on to 44 degrees. Before using the T flow block, rotate the entire unit to allow any air bubbles in the block to escape. Air bubbles can lead to uneven heating of the metal and may lead to suboptimal data quality. Check the temperature with a probe in several locations to ensure uniformity. The Infinium assay step X stain is a conjugation of extension and staining. The extension reaction adds a single labeled base to each probe. The purpose of this step is to discriminate between SNP genotypes. The single base extension reaction uses chain terminating dideoxynucleotides. The A and T nucleotides are labeled with dinitrophenyl, abbreviated as DNP, and the G and C nucleotides are labeled with biotin. The probes are enzymatically extended by a single base, and the label identifies the SNP genotype. A homozygote will have identical labels bound to the bead and a heterozygote will have a mixture of biotin and dinitrophenyl labels bound to the bead. Once the labels have been bound to the probe, the DNA template is no longer needed and is washed off the array. This means that only the labeled probes will be left on the beads. The second component of the X stain process is staining. The purpose of this step is to apply a specific fluorescent signal to each labeled probe. The first round of staining utilizes green fluorescent streptavidin and red fluorescent anti-DNP antibody. These fluorescent molecules bind specifically to the labeled probes. Next, biotin and DNP labeled antibodies are applied to the bead chip. By applying successive rounds of fluorescent molecules and labeled antibodies, the signal is amplified. If performing X stain manually, place the assembled flow through chamber into the T flow block. Pipette each single base extension reagent into the well and incubate, following the volumes and incubation times listed in your Infinium assay guide. When directed in the protocol, change the water circulator setting to the temperature indicated by the staining reagent tube. Once the T-flow block has reached the correct temperature, add the stain bead chip reagents as directed in the assay guide. Once the X stain protocol is complete, immediately remove the flow through chambers from the T flow block. Place them horizontally on a bench top at room temperature. The last step in the Infinium assay is imaging. After the staining process, the bead chip is ready to be imaged on an Illumina scanner. The purpose of this step is to generate fluorescence intensity data that can be analyzed to make genotype calls for each SNP. The Illumina scanner uses red and green lasers to excite the fluorophores and measure the fluorescence intensity signal for each bead on the array. In the example on the right, the homozygote TT will produce primarily red signal, while the homozygote CC will produce primarily green signal. The AG heterozygote 
will produce approximately equal red and green signals. When images of heterozygous beads are overlaid, the bead will appear yellow in intensity, due to the emission of both red and green fluorescence in the same bead location. Here is an actual image from an Illumina scanner. The signal from red and green beads are displayed separately. The Illumina scanner produces fluorescence intensity data files that are used in genetic analysis. Place up to four bead chips at a time into the Illumina scanner. Barcodes will be read automatically, and once decode files and output paths are defined, scanning will begin. Whole genome genotyping data will be extracted from images collected from the Illumina scanner in downstream analysis. For questions concerning best practices or lab techniques discussed in this video, please contact Illumina Technical Support at 1-800-809-4566 or at techsupport at illumina.com.